Hello everyone and welcome to today's little video on DNA print fingerprinting or STR analysis. So STR stands for short tandem repeats or STR. So what is this? This is what's used in a lot of different settings. So in for crime scene analysis, maternal, uh, paternal or maternity tests, all sorts of things. I'll go through a little background on this and then we'll go through some examples for how it's done. Uh, so we're going to talk about some key uh, biotech, uh, biotechnology methods that are used to do these studies. Uh, so here first, a little background on STRs, what they are. So I said STR stands for short tandem repeats. They are exactly what that means. So two to four bases and they repeat. So meaning here we have one, two, three, TGC. There's one, there's another. There's another. So this STR, short tandem repeat from person A, has three repeats. This one has one, two, three, four, five. Five repeats. So what is significant about this? How can we use this as a diagnostic tool? So this can be used in criminal cases, maternity or paternity test. If we find unknown remains, we can use it as a tool to maybe determine whose remains they belong to. And then this can also be used for genetic disorder testing. So a lot of different ways these STR can be used. And so now what's the differing? So these are the same STR. So this is looking at STR from person A and person B. This one has three, different. this one has five. So we can actually distinguish these two individuals based on their STRs. This is why this is sometimes referred to as DNA fingerprinting. We all have our own fingerprint of the short tandem repeat. So where do we find these? These are found in non-coding DNA regions. So these are called the introns in our DNA. We have these known repeats. So there are 13 loci, which are these repeats, recognized in the United States vi uh, via the CODIS system within the FBI. So whenever a crime scene analysis is done and you're comparing suspects to um, DNA found at the crime scene, they are compared using 13 different ones. Why do we use 13? Some countries used more or less. I think UK uses 17. So we have just 13 generally recognized ones here that we use. And it's because we can't just use one. There's, I think, a 5 to 20% chance that your STR1 is the same length as someone else's STR. So you have to do multiple tests, multiple STR tests, in order to increase the likelihood that it's an actual match. Uh, and then... PCR analysis or crime scene, this DNA analysis alone, isn't enough to convict someone. You still need more substantial evidence in order for the conviction, but it, it allows for further proof of it. So like I said, there is a small chance that same loci has the same number of repeats between two people. So whenever we read these results here, we're looking at multiple loci. So you want to compare more than one. So that's the background on this. It's where it's used, how it's important, and the differences we have in our DNA. So let's go right into an example now. So let's say we collect DNA samples from two suspects and we had a sample that we found at the crime scene. So we wanna test these DNAs and compare their sequences. So we wanna do STR analysis with these. Now, what is the first step we have to do? So we have three different DNA samples. What do we need to do to that DNA? So we have to do this technique called PCR or polymerase chain reaction. So what is polymerase chain reaction? It's a very, very common technique used in biotechnology. So let's say we had, you know, one, let's just go for, through one example here of one person's DNA. PCR, polymerase chain reaction, uses DNA polymerase to replicate this. So this is mimicking, tran, uh, not transcription, DNA replication. I was getting ahead of myself. So it mimics mimics DNA replication. So we're just making tons and tons of the same little sequence. So when you get when you give your DNA, if you're a suspect, you give your entire genome in one of your nuclei. And you will it would take multiple cells when you do a cheek swab. Now that we want to then focus on just those STRs. How do we just get those short tandem repeats out? Well we can label for them. Let's say, let's change color here. Let's say that short tandem repeat was this little red region right here. And this, uh, let's say this is person A. Um, and we're only showing this example for person A. So what happens is it goes through what a 
instrument or device called a thermocycler. So, we'll, you know, we'll stay with red here. So the first step is denaturing. So denaturing breaks these strands in half. So this denaturing step separates these two strands. And now we do have the region of interest in the middle there still as well, but I'm not going to continue. I'll, I'll draw it on this one. So we have that region of interest or that STR, that certain number of repeats right there. So next step, we need to anneal. Anneal is when you attach these things called primers to the sequence. So a primer matches the base pairs that are sticking out right here. So there's a forward and a reverse primer. So those primers come in and then they fill in the new sequence here. And they go either forward or reverse. And then they would continue going down through and doing this cycle. So then you anneal, you stick that primer in, and then the next step is elongation. So elongation then fills in the remaining sequences. So then you continue filling in these sequences. Um, and then, so I drew this backwards. One would be a forward one and one would be a reverse one. So you'd have one going that way then as well. And let me fix this. Boom. So you'd have a forward and reverse primer. In the end, you'd still have the parent strand remaining. But this is, so you have denaturing, annealing, and then elongation. Elongation is unique because it uses an enzyme known as TAC polymerase. This is isolated from thermophilic bacteria. Meet thermophilic meaning heat loving. So this TAC polymerase actually works best at 72 degrees Celsius. Denaturing happens at around 94 degrees Celsius. So you heat it up really hot and that separates the hydrogen bonds that are formed between these two strands of DNA. You then break it in half, you break all those hydrogen bonds and you anneal and the annealing temperature depends on the base composition of your primer. Let's just say in this example, it's at 52 degrees Celsius. So we put it at 52 degrees Celsius, we attach the primers and then we increase the temperature to 72 degrees that activates TAC polymerase. TAC polymerase then comes in and throws down new nucleotides. Now let's just focus on the region of interest or the STR. So this was one cycle. Now each of these would then go again and then we'd form two from each of those. And then each of these would then double again. I'm running out of room. And I'll just draw one more down here. So boom, 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 boom. Now these are double-stranded DNAs, trust me, but it's just focused on the STR. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight strands of just the STR after just three cycles of this. So here you do the whole process again, you do the whole process again. And a typical PCR runs for 35 cycles. That's two to the 35 DNA, that's billions of copies of just this one STR. So the whole purpose of this polymerase chain reaction here is to replicate that DNA because you can have a little bit of DNA from a crime scene and then end up with billions of whatever that DNA is. So now we just isolated that one STR. So this is how it's done for one loci. Let's say this is STR1. Uh, so you have to do this for each loci you're checking and also each suspect DNA needs to be digested and going through this PCR analysis separately. So now what do we do? What's the next step? We have all of this DNA and we have a high enough concentration now we can analyze it. So we do something called gel electrophoresis. So what is gel electrophoresis? Gel electrophoresis is when we load those DNA samples into a gel. So this is just a top-down look at this gel. If we look at the side of this gel, and magnify in, it's this porous matrix. And I was drawing it like that. So now imagine some STRs are this length, there's a DNA double strand. Some are a longer length, like that. And some might be more of a medium length. So now this is how we now separate these based on size. These shorter fragments are going to move through this matrix much faster. So down here, these ones are going to be the shorter ones. The further it goes, the shorter it is. The longer ones 
are going to be think of a you know a kid running through a forest compared to a parent running or an adult running through a forest. The adult's going to get stuck in the brush and so forth. The kid can run right through. So these ones are here are the longer bands. So longer. And then the medium sized bands will end up in the middle. So medium. Yes. Medium. There. So that's just the general features of how this works. So how does it separate? So DNA typically carries a negative charge. In gel electrophoresis, so we just described the gel component, now the electro component. So it runs the DNA, it separates the DNA based on a charge. It runs it through a charge gradient. So DNA is given a negative charge because of those oxygens um, in those phosphate groups. And also you usually use something called SDS, which gives it a negative charge as well. It makes them all the same charge. Uh, so when you put it in this electrophoresis chamber, so this chamber is this little structure here. Uh, you put the gel right on top right here, and then you have an electrode on this end, an electrode on this end. You put a solution in here that is called a buffer. So it's an ionic solution. And then here you'd have a positive electrode. Here you'd have a negative electrode. So charge would flow through this. And then DNA, if put down here, would flow that way. So remember, opposite charges attract. So if you put this gel in backwards and you put the DNA on the negative, the wrong side, on the positive side, it will run right off the back of the gel. So the, the uh, terminology is always run to red. So red electrodes are usually the positive electrode, black electrodes are the negative electrode. So you always run to red. The DNA will separate then based on size since the charge is pretty universal across it. So now we can compare the samples. Now this isn't uh, looking at a specific STR analysis. This was just to give a little introduction to uh, gel electrophoresis. And that's important to now understand. So we have all these STRs. So let's say we did three. We had STR one through three, and we did the PCR and we ran it on the gels. Let's look at our results. So we performed STR analysis on our three DNA samples for three different loci. Uh, so these are the examples below. So do either of your suspects match the crime scene sample? How do you know? So let's do an analysis. Actually, I'll switch back to red here. So let's look at them. So here's STR1. Person A, why are there two lanes here? So if we're just looking at STR1, think about it. You get your genes from your parents. That means you got one chromosome from your mother, one chromosome from your father. Your mother and father likely had two different sizes in that STR. Um, so you might have gotten three repeats from your mother and six repeats from your father. So you'd have two different sizes there. And that's why most of these, well, all of these have two lines on them. Those two lines represent one that you got from your mother, one that you got from your father. If there was an example here, I should have included one actually. Let's imagine those two weren't there and you just had one line. That means you're homozygous at that STR, or the one from your mother and father are both the same number of repeats. So it's very likely that there's a chance that you could have one line if you're doing STR analysis on yourself, and that tells you you're homozygous. And uh, gel electrophoresis is kind of the old school way to do this. Now they use this laser technology where they can see the peak size. So two little peaks are for you know STR1, it means you're heterozygous at that, one from mother, one from father, two different um, lengths. A larger peak, larger energy peak there, suggests you're homozygous at that. Uh, but I'm representing just reading gel electrophoresis results here. Uh, so STR locus one, let's see what our results are. So person A matched person B here. So we're matching the distance right here, also matched the crime scene. Now the other one from the crime scene also matches person A. Remember, there's a chance now that person A might be the culprit. However, there's that chance that STR are the same between two individuals, like five to 20% chance. Uh, then person B here has no match right there. If person B matched there, there would be a, a line right there. Okay, so that's STR1 and person A could be the person. STR2 now, they all match. Again, there's a chance. There's always a chance this could happen. 
your crime scene person B and person A match. Maybe all these people were you know, in a similar family or cousins are closely related or something like that. So a higher chance of matching. And then person A and then oh, here STR3. Let's look at this one now. Now person A matches with the crime scene for that um, length of the STR. Also for the second one. So they're both heterozygous here. And then person B matches that uh, bottom line. No, actually it doesn't. Person B doesn't. A little, little uh, shorter for these ones. So there's no match. So person A matches here, person A matches here, and person A matches here. So this suggests that person A matches the crime scene DNA. So now, you know, further investigation can be done here, but we can only present the science of the STR analysis. And again, this is showing three. We can do up to 13 with the FBI. Okay, I just want to show one other example here how this could be used. So a woman is suing her former lover for child support, but he claims that he is not the father of her child. An STR analysis was performed for the case and is shown below. So this is a Maury show now. Whose claim does the analysis support? How do you know? So let's read this and see if we can figure it out. So here's the mother, the child, and the father. So we want to know if the father is the father of the child. So this is a little different. So now we know that child should have half of its STR genes from the mother, half of the STR genes from the father. So one of the bars should match from each. Each. Let's look. So here, the child on this one, it matches the mother's. This one matches the father's. So that one checks. Now let's look at the next one. Child here matches the mother's. Child here matches the father's. Check. Now let's check the last one. Uh-oh, there's only one. So the child is homozygous right here, meaning got the same length from the father and the mother. So the mother has that length, and now the father also has to have that length. So this one could be true too. So here, it could prove that the father is the father. Um, so this would support the mother in this lawsuit here. So this would, again, it's only checking three loci. Uh, but it's uh, suggesting that the father has enough genetic matches to the child. And this one is especially important because there's a low chance that someone else also carries this same one. So now if the child got this one, it would also prove it, but the child may have gotten this one here. So this was just a little introductory thing. Yes, uh, doing this in a laboratory, in a you know, clinical or, not, or actual a crime scene lab would use, you know, the laser technique. Um, some might still use a PCR analysis, but I just wanted to go over this little example. We could see this on an exam or something like that, analyzing one of these and trying to figure out who's the father, who's the mother, is the child the child, and so forth. But if you have any questions on this, feel free to let me know. If not, I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you all next time, and bye-bye.